so um, yes, so I'm presenting on Joseph Paxton. I had um, I had thought coming to this event that I only had my PhD hat on and, uh, and I prepared a paper, but um, clearly yesterday Caroline wasn't having any of that and she kind of um, got me swapping hats over and, and talking about practice and so on. Um, so my PhD is not about Paxton. He's one of a series of case studies. Um, uh, actually, the kind of chronologically the first one, but the last one I'm writing. And, uh, and the title of this is The Manufacture of Architecture, Joseph Paxton and the Development of the Great Stove. So Joseph Paxton was born in 1803 in Bedfordshire and left home at the age of 13, seemingly with little formal education to be employed in physical work as a gardening boy. After various apprenticeships, he was taken on as a labourer by the Horticultural Society, recently relocated to Chiswick Gardens. It was here that in 1826, Paxton met the sixth Duke of Devonshire, William Cavendish, one of the country's richest men. The portrayal of the meeting by Paxton's granddaughter, Violet Markham, indicates some of the later romanticisation of the event. A gate divided the Duke's garden from the grounds of the Horticultural Society. It was a pleasant stroll from one to the other. Though not at that time an enthusiast, he found much to interest him in the society's plants and flowers, for new varieties were very fashionable and the curious were interested in such things. During his strolls, his attention was drawn to a short, pleasant looking man who often opened the gate for him. The Duke, temporarily lacking a gardener at his Chatsworth estate and clearly charmed, made a bold decision and offered the young and relatively inexperienced Paxton the job as head gardener. Two weeks later, Paxton had moved north to Chatsworth and from here, deep within the Derwent Valley, his experiments in glasshouse construction began. At first, Paxton's energies were directed towards general garden maintenance, but subsequently, from 1828 until 34, Paxton undertook the construction of a series of small to medium-sized timber forcing houses and glass houses, arriving at incremental improvements in their design. Key developments at this stage were oriented towards better horticultural performance and included the refinement of the sash bar profile, the practical application of ridge and furrow roofing, and the invention of what was later famously known as the Paxton gutter. So I'm going to start my first one. Actually, I'm talking about two drawings, but I'm going to um, start with one image prior to the drawings. These small forcing houses and glass houses were primarily associated with providing fruit and vegetables for consumption. But the growth of global trade that followed colonial expansion resulted in the import of ever larger exotic specimens. And this was to radically alter the character of the buildings constructed. By the early to mid 19th century, the relationship between colonialism, industrial production, overseas trade and botany was well developed in Britain. Colonies provided a source for the forceful extraction of raw material and labor, including a range of plants for consumption, such as tea and tobacco, and for manufacturing transformation, such as rubber and cotton. But these lands, again through force, also represented a captive market for the British industrial manufacturers to export back to. The great glass houses of the age celebrated this transactional economy, creating artificial environments that replicated the climates of the foreign land, both nurturing and exhibiting their botanical bounty. More expansive spaces were needed to house these plants, and a sense of showmanship and spectacle became associated with these symbols of a reimagined Eden. The buildings were subsequently located away from the working kitchen gardens and into the ornamental landscapes of the landed aristocracy. In 1835, Paxton started working on what was to become the largest realization of this new building type in the world, a project on an altogether different scale to his earlier structures, the Great Conservatory, more commonly known as the Great Stove. The building was huge and the layout was simple, a rectangular plan of 277 feet, by 123 feet and 67 feet high. Um, this is actually uh, not a photograph of the construction. This is a kind of from the, um, quite a while later in the late 19th century, it's kind of repairs, but useful in terms of scale. To accommodate the heights of the enormous palm trees planned, the volume was configured as a central generous nave with lower side aisles. Hollow cast iron columns connected to a box gutter ring beam and in turn supported curved and laminated structural timber ribs.
Beneath this majestic structure, plant specimens were arranged geographically rather than botanically, and to complete the sense of theatre, silver fish swam in water pools while exotic birds flew overhead. The design of the great stove was to some extent a culmination of the various innovations of Paxton's previous years, but the sheer size of the building did however lead to two new and extremely significant shifts in how these structures were conceived and constructed. Until the abolition of the glass tax in 1845, building conservatories at this extraordinary scale was prohibitively expensive, and despite the great wealth of his employer, Paxton turned his mind to reducing costs. Significantly, while his earlier developments had looked at improving design performance, he now looked at opportunities to reduce labour costs. As construction commenced on the masonry foundation walls of the great stove, Paxton purchased a four and a half horsepower steam engine and for two years experimented with how he might combine this with a manual grooving machine. Eventually his tests were complete and he was able to use the machine for the glazing of the stove's glass and timber covering with the first application in August 1838. So this is my first drawing which I will um, read a little bit about and then I'll stop and explain. So the sash bar machine was operated by a single man and a boy and produced 500 bars of 1.2 metre length each day. In total, 40 miles of sash bar were produced for the building using this machine, reportedly saving £1,200. <clears throat> kind of colossal sum at the time. In its first simpler version, the machine only produced the grooves for the sash, but Paxton continued improvements until the machine was able to produce complete bars through a series of processes. It worked through three operations. Firstly, timber planks were passed through the angle cutter, producing lengths of the basic profile. That's, uh, um, so this is the... Uh, this end is the kind of cutter. Um, these lengths were then passed two times through a grooving profile, once for each face, to produce the final detailed form of the bars. The axle revolves 1,200 times a minute, guaranteeing a fine finish to the timber of the sash bars. Paxton wrote to the Royal Society describing his invention and providing an accompanying drawing. And for this innovation was awarded the Society's silver medal in 1841. Up to this time, Paxton's experiments had been of such a scale that the timber elements acted as primary structure in a single span, initially as sash bars onto the masonry wall of a forcing frame, and later as the Paxton gutter within the larger glass houses. This was no longer possible at the scale of the great stove, and here an independent structural system of iron was formed that supported the timber elements. Paxton's constructional system was to undergo one final refinement at Chatsworth. Having acquired a rare Victoria Regia giant water lily in 1849, the plant fast outgrew the glass house it had been placed within, and a new home, the Victoria Regia house, was rapidly constructed to accommodate it. Once again, the timber glazing system was of a secondary order, supported perpendicularly on a light iron framework beneath. But here the roof was flat. The camber of the Paxton gutters and the pitch of the ridge and furrow roofing allowing for foot for drainage. The two systems of iron structural frame and timber and glass covering, each operating independently, were later characterised by Paxton in the analogy of the table and the tablecloth. The Victoria Regia House, described as a diminutive structure by Paxton, was completed in early 1850 and became the model for the much larger Crystal Palace building for the Great Exhibition, designed by Paxton a few months later. Following initial design work on the Hyde Park project, Paxton was encouraged by his colleague Robert Chance, supplier of glass to these projects, to patent the design of the tablecloth. And just days after Paxton's patent submission for certain improvements in roofs, his Crystal Palace designs were made public. So the patent has uh, two parts to it. The first is the written description. So it, it's, made up of, it's made up of the written text, which is um, a series of uh, pages describing, um, as I said, the certain improvements in roofs. Um, and the text describes what he's done, which is different and new and kind of can be patented. And then the first drawing, which is this one here, describes the tablecloth. So this is the um, uh, two sections at the top of it, um, running, uh, this is the kind of zigzag of it. Um, or when I say zigzag, this is, this is what uh, they kind of describe as a ridge and furrow. Um, so on the um, Victoria Regia house, this is 
uh, flat, but on the um, great stove, this uh, ridge and furrow profile follows the line of the curvature of the um, uh, laminated timber structures. So this is the ridge and furrow, then this is the Paxton gutter. So what happens is uh, there's a piece of timber from here to here, and um, it is with an iron rod, it's uh, tensioned, which basically gives it a camber so that uh, it operates, the, the iron rod and the timber together operate as a structural member, but also the camber allows it to operate as a gutter, so that the water runs off from the centre downwards. And then between two gutters, so in going the other way, that's the, that's the timber section with the gutter kind of cut into it, and then that's the iron rod, and then this is the kind of um, profile. So two gutters structurally support the um, ridge and furrow roof. And so this gutter is, this is a series of details. With, this is the, um, is the kind of key one. Actually, this is a single piece of timber. And what they do is they kind of cut out the, um, the gutter form. This supposedly picks up external water, and these pick up internal water. Supposedly the condensation from the uh, underside of the glass gets picked up in these channels, and, which also follow down. And then those gutter elements kind of land in these end pieces here um, and in the, various, um, in the various projects this is then taken down a kind of a, um, a cast iron hollow column so that the column acts as both the, um, as, as the, yeah, as the kind of, um, as the outlet for water but also the vertical support. And then, so this is the, this is the primary drawing and then actually this secondary drawing is is a kind of um, almost like an option study. It's, it's like he's he he's here, kind of exploring different um, different ideas of what the table might be. So this is this is the tablecloth, which has a has a kind of uniform application. And then he's it, with this second drawing, he's kind of saying, and you could do the structure in this way or that way. Or so I'll pick up again the um, the narrative. Um, so the patent expresses a construction methodology where structural integrity, drainage and weather protection are integrated into a single system. Rather than a specific building form, the patent represents the conception of an independent and standardised cladding system, suggesting a building process of serial production of repeated and standardised components. Significantly, while relating to both the small and delicate Victoria Regia, Regia House and to the unprecedented scale of the Crystal Palace, the patent was open-ended in its application. Free from compositional articulation, the system could cover any form of structure in a potentially limitless manner. The Great Stove represents the early introduction of modern machinery and methodologies to the construction process. The way the fabrication of a standardized system was subsequently conceptualized, as represented by the patent, transformed the idea of building as craft made to the idea of building a system, and in doing so transformed the relationship of labor to construction. Similarly, the sash bar machine, in reducing labor costs, radically altered the type of work undertaken, replacing handcrafted carpentry with machine operation. The organisation of building work became reduced to the repetition of simple tasks and, in this project, in place of 20 skilled carpenters, one of the country's richest men was instead able to employ an unskilled man and a boy. Here the Industrial Revolution had been introduced to building practices, both in terms of the introduction of machines and machine use to the construction site, and in the introduction of the logic of capitalist production. In this, labour-saving technological innovation was inextricably associated with the process of de-skilling. The skills of trained artisans that guaranteed livelihood and autonomy no longer required and substituted by the precarity of low-skilled labour. This process was later examined by Harry Braverman, who noted that capitalism was characterised by the incessant drive to enlarge and perfect machinery on the one hand and to diminish the worker on the other. In developing and refining this particular machine and this patented construction system, Paxton was not working apolitically, but was actively involved in and indeed played a significant role within a broader historical process. 
Through these drawings, Joseph Paxton was inviting the production logic of the factory to the building site.